Hello and welcome to another episode of Heal Thyself, Benefits of Holistic Living. I'm host Mia Sines, and in this segment with me is Stacy Couch, and Stacy is a certified shamanic practitioner. So it's lovely to have her with us because we get to learn all about what being a shaman is about and how it works holistic and beautiful wellness of, of moving in our life and shifting and changing and allowing us other ideas to to research. So welcome, Stacy. It's wonderful to have you. Yes, thank you. I'm really glad to be here today. Me too. So share with us before we get into our, our, our talk back and forth, share with us um, how you found and discovered and changed your life to live the, the life that you live today. And we're going to see beautiful little animals going back and forth behind <laughs> Stacy. I just saw a beautiful <laughs> kitty. <laughs> so share with us um, your journey, if you will. Yeah, I would say it was something that's always been with me, in the, at least in the background, mm -hmm. my whole life, uh, in terms of my spiritual seeking, and my spiritual path. I was really lucky as a child to have a mother who was with a group of wise women, and they studied the light work and meditation. So I learned about alternative healing and, and spiritual practices from a very early age. But I didn't know you could make a living doing that. <laughs> if I would have known <clears throat> at an early age that I could have made a lifestyle out of it, I probably would have gone that direction. But I was very much wanting to make a living and also be out in nature. <clears throat> so I spent a lot of time out in nature and working with wildlife. And still that spiritual calling was coming from within. And I actually had the benefit of meeting a shamanic practitioner along my path. and. And when I had the first session with her was when I realized that this is actually the niche of spiritual work uh, where I belong. That's awesome. Congratulations, mm -hmm. because there are so many people out there who are not, I don't want to say brave enough, but haven't, well, brave enough to take that mm -hmm. first step to say, I'm, I'm standing in, in the path that I love and I'm going to do it hell or high water. When you say that and you mean it yeah. is when, is when heaven and earth opens up and you can create the most magnificent life that supports you where you can support others. So that's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And there is that undeniable calling that comes from deep within our soul. Mm -hmm. And we think it, we think it means a certain career or a certain vocation, but it ends up being a certain way of being in the world and a certain way of helping others. Yeah. Well, let's talk about first, um, what is shamanism? It is both a spiritual practice and also a worldview. So it's very similar to Buddhism in that in the shamanic, in the shamanic way, we believe that everything is animate. Everything has a soul. And it's very earth-braced as well. So that's why I resonate with it really strongly because it's very much involved with working with the mother and then also working with nature so animals and trees and the plants i love plant medicine it's one of my side hobbies as well mm -hmm. and so i love that because shamanism takes all of these different pieces of things i'm interested in, animals and plants and and science i'm interested in the in the way the world works ecology those mm -hmm. kinds of things as well so it takes all of those and combines them together but it's also a spiritual practice and a healing practice there are modalities within shamanism that are alternative healing therapies actually mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome i love that i love that so share with us a challenge um of the move from science to shamanism yes please yeah. thank you yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah in this interview i'm going to be giving her short little uh cues on and i'm going to have her run the show because <laughs> it just that's the way i'm rolling today <laughs> fun yeah it was it was really tough because in, I was really entrenched in the scientific world. I was going down the path to get a master's degree and a PhD. I was working with some of the top ecologists in the nation, really, both fisheries and seabird ecology. And I loved it. I loved finding patterns and learning about different ways that different animals and ecosystems were connected, the whole web of life, right? I loved studying that. and. I was very, very into it. I had invested a good six years of my life in it. And that I, when I looked forward, that was what I saw. But then I had this calling and I had this gap or this, 
a void or empty space within me that I was looking to fill and this question I was sitting with of well what's the bigger picture and and then that's what brought me into shamanism but it was hard it was hard to, t to say to my family hey look this is what I'm going to do <laughs> you know it was a total 180 almost and it was hard to explain myself to people because I went to a two-year program my husband and I moved across country so that I could go to a shamanic school for two years and I worked there as well so I went from you know, being a scientist and having a very conventional on the outside lifestyle and my spiritual practice, well, I didn't have to talk to anybody about it if I didn't want to. And then I went, then I went to it being my whole life. And so it was pretty scary and it took a lot of courage, definitely. It really does take courage and authenticity to step into who you are. There are so many people, I'm sure you have experienced that too. They want to share their story. They want to tell stuff but they don't want to identify themselves. So they're not living congruently to who they are. They haven't mastered that space. So I congratulate you for even recognizing that it was friggin' hard to do yeah. that. You know, I yeah. mean, it is very hard. I, I had gone through different stages too, where I was like, oh, should I hide this part of myself? Should I do that? You can't, you can't mm -hmm. and to and to be a bearer of light. You absolutely cannot do that. You have to be true to you, so. And I love and the it, fact that you say that it was hard to make that decision and then step forward and here I am world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's those thoughts that go through our head, right, about, oh, are they going to think I'm crazy? And then in the depths of the night, sometimes I wonder if I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. And it, But it was amazing, really, how many people ended up listening to my story and resonating with it and sharing similar stories that they'd been essentially in the closet with. They hadn't had anybody else to share it with. And that was the validation to have the experience of other people getting the joy of being able to share what was going on for them as well. And also having the benefit of the love of my family that they were accepting of me no matter what and my friends as well. So that was a very, that was a worthwhile part of the experience. That's awesome. That really is brilliant. Awesome. Let's talk about hawks because um, that's your um, power animal, right? Yep. Um, okay, so um, let's, well, I guess before we do that, we'll jump back. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm teasing you all. <laughs> um, but so that she can, so we understand smoothly to segue into it. Um, share with us the description um, or the message that animals have with us and how we relate to them and can support support it for, yeah. for our experience animals I think if we were to if I was to say the big picture message that I've gotten from my work with animals and from that calling that's coming from within is that they are speaking to us all the time we used to live in a world where we were very intimate with animals where wild animals where we they were helpers for us and we had an intimate relationship with them and saw them on a daily basis. And now we, they're still there. We're just not noticing them. Uh, there's still red-tailed hawks in the middle of New York City. There's still foxes that are denning under our porches and skunks that are crossing the road in front of us, yeah. right? And they're still there and we're just not noticing them. Mm -hmm. And if we start to open up and notice them around, I think, the aware awareness, and that's really the first step of any spiritual practice, right? Mm -hmm. But becoming aware of the wildlife that's around us is the first piece. And then the way that we can start to take in their messages is not necessarily that we're going to hear them say something to us in our heads, although that might happen. Uh, oftentimes it really starts out with just the timing, mm -hmm. that we have a rabbit cross our path at a time that we're starting to go down a new wormhole or new rabbit hole into mm -hmm. new adventure. And so the timing's really key, and then also looking at the metaphor, so looking at stories that the animals show up in, because there's messages in that. So like Alice in Wonderland is, a, you know, seeing a rabbit, we can think about that story and what that whole mythology speaks to in us. And then the other piece is their biology as well. So they have this whole life, they, they all the way from how they have young and raise their young to what they eat. So. For example, rabbits are altricial, which means they're born without any fur and blind, so they're absolutely helpless when they're born. And then we have horses, which are born 
precocial, so they can stand within a few minutes of being born and are, you know, absolutely their own individualized little beings and ready to get going. So when we're birthing a creative project in the world, if we have a rabbit show up as a spirit animal or a horse show up as a spirit animal, it's going to be a completely different message about that project. Mm -hmm. So with the rabbits, we're going to have uh, a project that's going to need lots of nurturing and care and protection and oversight. Mm -hmm. And with the horses, once we birth that project into the world, we can just be ready to watch it start to have an effect on other people. That's powerful. Thank you. That's that's mm -hmm. amazing. Um, how do we determine? <laughs> we didn't talk about this beforehand. How do we determine <laughs> our um, our power animal? There are um, two that resonate with me that I feel are absolutely my power animal. Um, but I'm not a shaman per se. I have very similar, some similar belief systems. I'm very much a, a lover of Mother Earth, a nurturer of animals. I talk to plants. I've had um, peach trees in my places that I've lived bloom amazing because I spent the time talking to them twice or three times or four times a day and then people would say I've never seen such a harvest before you know and then to even examine the fruit and realize that that they represent the feminine body parts all however you look at it you know yeah. just fantastic um <laughs> <laughs> I love it yes how do we recognize our um our power animal there, you don't have to be a shaman or a shamanic practitioner to have a spirit animal. That's the key piece, is to realize that part. And the second part is to know that you don't have to have a shamanic practitioner retrieve that animal for you either. So we, we think that there has to be all this formality around it. We think there's a lot of myths around power animals or spirit animals. And one of those is also that we only have one. And I am here to tell you that I have a whole host that I work with. Mm -hmm. And so do all of my clients. When I do healing sessions for my clients, all sorts of different power animals show up. And I retrieve additional ones every time. So, and then they have this whole host of guides, of guardian angels looking over them and helping them with what they're going through. And some stay with us for our whole life and others come in and out to help us at different crossroads. And as well, they are very, um, sorry, just <laughs> lost my thought. <laughs> but they, they come in and out at different times in our life. And oh, and then how do we find them? That's where I was looping back to. So when the way that we find them can be any number of ways. They can cross our paths in this current day reality. They can come to us in dreams. Uh, or we can just be really drawn to them like you're talking about. Uh, as a child, I was really drawn to dolphins and whales. That was, a, it was because they were a spirit animal mm -hmm. and because their power and the energy that they embodied, it, it just, I resonated with mm -hmm. it at that time. And mm -hmm. it was, I learned a lot from them at that time in my life. You know, it's funny because um, my favorite animals growing up, especially to collect, were elephants and turtles. Loved them. <laughs> but yet I would sit for hours on end at the ocean looking for dolphins. And I used to tell people when they'd say, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm waiting for my family. I'm looking for my mm -hmm. family. <laughs> I just knew that I was from the ocean type of, of feeling. So um, I've heard recently that we can shift and change. That's why um, the panther has always um, intrigued me, has always been one of the animals out of anywhere that you see where they're brought together, a zoo or something. Um, I've just been fascinated with, or even just I understand their look as a woman and as a, I don't know, a seductress, I guess you'd say, <laughs> I totally get it. You know, it's like, yeah. I, I, I resonate with that. I understand, I understand your movements. I understand who you are. I understand you're talking to, I mean, literally, I, I, until the last couple of years, I didn't know that I could feel that essence of, you know, what they're looking at and then understanding what they're saying to me. Um, mm -hmm. And also the butterfly, which is not really even an animal, but an insect. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that's part of the transformation as a transformational yeah. practitioner, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really cool. And I would love people to just, you know, look at Stacy's stuff and, and just figure out what is powerful to you because I don't bring them in or call them in like a lot of people do. And I should probably, or I could probably more um, for support. I'm just, uh, you know, I, I do my thing differently, but I totally 
honor and appreciate. And when I see either an image of one of those or even a butterfly flying by at the right time, it's like, thank you. You know, thank you for showing me that this is, you know, I'm on my right path or reminding me of my path or mm -hmm. who I am. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that is one of the, the very most common ways that these spirit animals speak to us is just as an affirmation. Mm -hmm. You're on the right path mm -hmm. or as a reminder yeah. to get back. And when we start to fall off the path to get mm -hmm. back on it. Yeah. 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 Will you share with us how hawks have um, been a perfect mirror for you? Yeah. They, I would say that the hawks really, they were a type of spirit animal that came for a really, really specific time in my life. And that was the time around when the calling came for me and when I discovered shamanism. And I, in my book, Gracious Wild, I talk about my relationship with a couple of hawks that were in a raptor education program. They were... Uh, captive. They were handicapped. They couldn't be released mm -hmm. back into the wild. Uh, they had limited flight abilities. So they had shown an ability to be around people and be okay in front of an audience. And so I got to work with them and help train them to go and spread the word about just the value of having birds of prey in our ecosystems and, and looking out for them. So that's what I was doing on the outer, on the inner. I was doing my spiritual search. And as I started to get into shamanism, I started to dig up old some old wounds mm -hmm. that it was time to look at and that were causing a lot of unconscious fear in my life. And really, I was being, I was prevented from moving forward because I was still had these wounds that I was, you know, denying and, and not, not knowing what to do with, essentially. And in the shamanic work, I was able to start uh, working with them and not regressing back to them, but healing them. And at the same time, I was working with a hawk who was, in, when I first started all this, her name was Talia, and she was very nervous. She was a very anxious hawk, had, had a lot of issues about being in captivity that I was trying to help her work through, giving her consistency. And when she was anxious, I would start to get anxious. Oh, what is everybody going to think that I'm not, you know, they might mm -hmm. think I'm not good at this. And all of my lack of self-esteem or lack of self-confidence was mirrored in her anxiety. And then we were bouncing it back and forth. And so <laughs> that really gave me the impetus to start doing my healing work because I wanted to be a solid ground for her to stand on. And I was really working to save her life is what I was doing uh, because she wouldn't be kept in that pram if she was if she, she was not happy. So I really wanted to be the best that I could be for her. That was really my impetus. I have to love for the animals that I do something for them probably before I would for myself. But yeah, and it was just amazing to see how her how her calm came in when my healing came in mm. and we had some beautiful moments together like that that's really awesome mm -hmm. that's lovely yeah i you remind me of a girlfriend um and i hope she's watching this i haven't talked to her in several years but growing up we were the best of friends and she mm. um she went to school and became a uh, biologist and you talk about that ecosystem thing mm -hmm. she's been doing that for years at different um, locations. Uh, I think she's still in, she was in Monterey and Carmel. And I think she's in Santa Cruz where they even get down into the dirt to find what feeds what, to find the butterflies, to find this, to find that, you know, to keep it all growing and working. It's incredible the work that, uh, and, you know, and not talking to her in so many years, I just have that um, sense of shamanism towards her, you know, like that that's what she's up to. In mm -hmm. fact, I think I'm going to to write her after this mm -hmm. it's you know sometimes when our friends and families slip away mm -hmm. there's always an amazing opportunity to say hey come yeah. back you yeah know? come yeah. back i love you yeah yeah so you remind me of her so that's awesome oh, thank you i'm a little weepy <laughs> um okay so you were going to share with us um well we did already talk about the spirit animals right and how to implement them in. Um, let's talk about how you like to heal. Well, <laughs> of course you like to help heal. <laughs> Share with us um, about your shamanism that you're able to work with people and have healings long distance. Yeah. The, a beautiful thing about shamanism is that when I'm doing the work, I do go on what's called a shamanic journey. 
and I travel into other worlds. And some people would say in my mind's eye, but I see myself, my spirit, come up out of my body and travel into these other worlds. And I'm out outside of time and space when I'm doing that. And so what that means is that I can travel great distance to anybody around the world to deliver healings. So first I go into non-ordinary reality and I non-ordinary reality and I go either to the lower world which is below us or upper world which is above us and retrieve the healing and have this whole story unfold. It's really like exactly like a dream except for we're awake. Mm -hmm. So I narrate the story while it's happening and then people have the benefit of getting to listen to it and understand what's going on. And it's really your own myth about your healing that's coming, your own story, your own adventure that unfolds about your healing. And so I re retrieve the healing and bring that back, and then I'm able to deliver it long distance. So I work with quite a few clients by the phone, and it's and I've watched it really closely. I, I've believed in it from the start because when I started working with my shamanic practitioner, she was four states away, so we worked on the phone, and it made a huge difference for me. But still, even in my own practice, I watch between the people I work with directly and those long distance and the power of the healing is is exactly the same mm -hmm. whether we're in person or not which is really amazing and, and I have to attest to that not that I've had your um, healing work with you mm -hmm. I just met you recently um, but a healing is a healing in the power of in the energy within a practitioner that's strong and powerful absolutely I have people who feel me in Georgia you know in in Europe when we do actually let's go that far you know i think my furthest yeah. client away is bulgaria yeah. so um so it's absolutely so what she's saying is true and if you're interested in experiencing that with her it sounds very very cool so energy is energy and power and shifting is power and shifting of that energy no matter what um process that we teach so that's awesome share with us some of your most fun and exciting experiences um working with because you've worked with a lot of animals mm -hmm. and um share with us what some of those um you know the, the when we work with animals like okay this is kind of silly but it's not silly <laughs> my cat you know she's black she looks like a little black panther she has the same eyes she has the same hood on them like when she looks at me i get the sensation of i understand what's going on with the bigger one and with my little one so we have dogs we have cats we have rabbits we have um and i knew about the bunnies that you're talking about because mm. i've had eight um, oh, wow. in, in hutches um in a backyard years ago when my husband when my first husband and i were first married we had all so we, we were very a menagerie you know <laughs> yeah and and those little bunnies would actually uh procreate through wire which i didn't know oh wow <laughs> and so even though they were separated we'd have bunnies more bunnies so <laughs> will you share with us what um i really want more people to honor animals because there's a magnificent energy about them if you mm -hmm. have them you can see that some of them like enya this is you know because i'm in tune to her more probably than my other animals throughout my life because i have less to think about um i feel like i've known her through another lifetime you know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this is not just the first lifetime that we've been together and so um so share with us that kind of essence to honor animals and do you understand what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say? Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I just, I'm sorting in my head. That's okay. <laughs> oh, which one, which one mm -hmm. do I talk about? Yeah. So you're sharing about pe your pets, the animals that you have the opportunity to live with. And, yeah. and I, I think that's always an interesting question that I get from students in my workshops that I do is, is they want to, they're going on a shamanic, learning how to go on a shamanic journey, and their instructions are to go with a power animal, and they want to know if they can go with their animals. And so that's the question, right? Are our animals, mm -hmm. are our pets our power animals? And I, I would say yes and no, and like you're saying, I think it depends on the animal, too. Mm -hmm. I think some animals are more inclined to be shamanically gifted, and they can journey along with us. Like, my, ba my black cat who's sleeping behind me, so I have a black cat too, her yeah. name's Gretchen. And of course she's very, you do, we all yeah. do. Yeah. Us <laughs> magical beings always yeah. do. <laughs> yeah, she showed up under a trailer right when I decided uh, for the first time in my life, I'm not allergic to cats anymore, I'm gonna get a cat. And then she showed up, uh, yeah. 
And she is very, she shows up in my journeys as a Black Panther that I do. And it, it, I didn't realize it for four or five years. But it, what I finally made the connection that every time I had a journey with the Black Panther, she was somewhere nearby. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, my science mind still sometimes still <laughs> misses yeah. those kind of synchronicities. Yeah. And I have another kitty that you saw walk by. She's a little striped kitty. And she's just a sweet little thing that's just in this world. And she's my best buddy. And I love her. Uh, but we don't do the shamanic work together. Yeah. Uh, same thing. I have a couple horses. And they're, the themes with them weave in and out through my shamanic work. And they're guides in that the, the same way my friends and my, my best confidants are guides. And that they help near what's going on. They help support me through tough times. They're companions on my path. And the difference between that and the power animal is that power animals are in the spiritual realm. They're in spirit form. They don't, that means they don't come with any agenda. They're in the world, in non-ordinary reality. It's non-dual. Uh, there's no right and wrong, no left and right, no black and white. And so what ends up happening is they don't have an agenda and they don't have a preference our power animals don't for what happens. They are there to help guide our spiritual path, mm -hmm. which is absolutely different than our companions or our familiars in this life. They, are, they both provide us companionship and support, but one offers spiritual guidance in a deeper, more forward-looking way or more bigger picture way than we could ever imagine. And the others are, are able to offer a different perspective. Um, you know, I have one horse who's very extroverted, and I've learned a lot about extroversion in the time having her. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, there's, uh, they both have much value, but I think are distinctly different. Yeah. Yeah. I think that if everybody could honor animals in that sense, that we wouldn't have so much, of course, you have to become more evolved, but we wouldn't have so much animal abuse, mm -hmm. you know, and so that, that was my um, back, back end in my mind process of thinking about that when I asked you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're, we're getting close to the finish here. So would you like to share your free gift? Yes, I would. I have a free gift for everyone that is an ebook that I created, and it's called What is My Spirit Animal and How to Find and Understand Your Spirit Animal Guides. So this helps with, I was talking about those myths earlier, uh, goes through all the different myths that we have about, you know, that aren't true, all the things we believe about spirit animals that aren't true, and then tells about what is true about them and then ways to discover them. So we went through some here today together, but the book goes through more. And and then at the end gives a ton of resources, lots of links to different websites that talk about the biology mm -hmm. of these different spirit animals and also ways to find interpretations of them. I have a bunch of interpretations on my website. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's awesome. Yep. I love that. It's um, going to be fun for people to understand and you know, there's so many things about um, the world of shamanism that I haven't even heard you talk about some of them. I'm sure you work with them and whatever. But um, And that's what's so cool about these interviews is because everyone is uniquely different. Um, the thought of spirituality, of just like of God, you know, the word yeah. God. We A lot of people call it universe, source, creator, magnificent being. Um, Allah, Buddha, you know, all these, yeah. when really um, it's all the same. We just have different names for it. So Yes, exactly. Um, in shamanism, there's um, things about the, the, the wheel and um, things like that. Do you utilize that type of stuff in, in your everyday practice or just you do? Yeah, yeah, I work very, very frequently with the medicine wheel when I'm setting space for a ceremony or a class or even when I'm before I do a session, I call in the directions. Mm -hmm. So I say prayer in that way. So I do work with mm -hmm. the shamanic forms of prayer. And I also do soul retrieval. That's the main method of healing that I do as a part of my shamanic work. I like that. Will you talk a few minutes about that before we leave? Because mm -hmm. I think that yeah. that's very powerful for listeners. Yeah, soul retrieval you want to know about, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, so soul retrieval, very, very big picture, is the idea is that we have parts of ourselves that split off when a traumatic event in our life occurs. And it could be, and it doesn't have to be as outward as a car accident or uh, losing someone really close to us, although those are very obvious examples of soul loss. 
But another example would be an example of uh, being humiliated mm -hmm. in front of the whole class in high school or as a child or having a parent tell us that there's no way we could make a living being an artist. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different ways that we can lose part of our power, part of our personal power or our essence or what we call in shamanism a soul part. And what I do in the soul retrieval work is I go and I seek out the soul parts that want to come forward and help at this time, that's the key piece, is that they're coming back at this time, moment in time, to help you with what you're looking to move forward with and what you're looking for help around. And what comes back is not a regression, so we don't dig back deep into the trauma. Um, we touch on it so that people know where it is. But then also they are looking at really we talk about the gifts so we do anything to help heal the medicine I call it so anything to transmute that trauma or that pain and and then turn it into the gift that that soul part is because ultimately it's our own expression so I was talking about being an extrovert and learning how to do that that we all have access to it's just a soul part yeah. <laughs> that we either have or that we that we need to go find and get so we get the gift of bringing back that soul part and that power mm -hmm. so that we can live more of who we are in the world that's awesome. I was always told when I was a kid, um, I didn't have the most supportive mom. And I was told, well, when I was, I was told I was the ugly duckling. I was told, which is, you know, just when you were, it's like all these things. I was told I could not be a writer. I could, could not mm -hmm. be an artist because someone else in the family was. As, mm -hmm. if, as if we had to be pegged. Yeah. And, I'm the, and I'm the only one that's actually making a living with her face, who's making mm -hmm. a living as a writer, who's mm -hmm. making a living, you know what I mean? Yeah. As, a, as an artist creator. And mm -hmm. um, it blows my mind that I was limited and believed it until about eight years ago when I'm just like, this is bullshit. I want to truly live. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> at least at least we're not on on a public access you know i can say that word here so yeah. thank you for bringing that up because uh one we're all the same we're all have the same background icky stories and mm -hmm. so you sharing that really has probably brought people forward going oh stacy thank you i mm -hmm. i want to look at stacy's stuff so yeah so thank you it was it was yeah. wonderful to have you on the show and it was wonderful to learn about um, our power animals and how that we can retrieve them mm -hmm. and also about the soul retrieval so it was beautiful thank you so much yeah you're very welcome Mia. thank you so much for having me thank you yeah. and thank you all for joining us and we'll see you in another segment bye